So my name is Jenny and I'll be hosting this webinar. Um, and so we have Chris Barnes here uh, as our guest speaker and he is currently uh, the CTO and co-founder of a uh, gaming company called Dopio Games. Um, he's worked as a game developer for many years, uh, went to Cornell University like a lot of our instructors here at Katie Byte. Um, and majored in computer science. Uh, we also have uh, Rachel and Jackson here. Um, do you guys want to wave? <laughs> so Rachel and Jackson are our students here. Um, they both have T8 some of our classes and uh, Jackson works specifically as a software engineer intern uh, for us. So we will be um, working together to interview Chris um, and also uh, here on the slide uh, I just have a quick screenshot of our classes page. So I do want to talk um, a bit about Katie Byte. So we are a computer science academy. Uh, we've been around for six years and we teach uh, beginner to intermediate to advanced level computer science to pre-college students. So um, our strength is in our advanced classes and we in that we um, have taken a college level material to provide it to high school students um, and then we've built on top of our curriculum to allow for younger students um, as young as eight years old to take our classes um, and each class works uh, built on top of the other so that it's progressive and in that you can uh, get to the higher levels and learn uh, like algorithms, data st uh, structures, uh, compete in the USA Computing Olympiad, prepare for your AP, CS, um, also AI machine learning uh, research classes that I believe Jackson uh, you've taken before, right? Yep. Cool. Um, so that is us. Um, and so, yes, Chris will be uh, our guest speaker for today. And I have divided this um, webinar into uh, four main sections. The first, Chris will be talking about his educational background um, specific to his uh, CS journey. Um, and then um, we'll talk about his career uh, journey. Um, we'll, we'll be answering some uh, frequently asked parent questions specific to like uh, what the benefits are to gaming and what are some of the paths that uh, students who are interested in gaming can can uh, uh, proceed with uh, when they get into their professional careers and potentially work in the gaming industry. Um, and then we'll talk about the specifics um, of what uh, Chris's daily work day-to-day um, -day looks like and some of the more technical questions. Um, yeah, so does that sound good? Okay, cool. Um, so Chris, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Chris. Uh, mm -hmm. I, um, I've been working as a professional game developer for about 10 years now. Um, graduated Cornell in 2009. With, uh, my degree is actually in information science, um, which is oh, a okay. cool program Cornell has that actually fuses uh, computer science with uh, humanities and kind of teaches you a little bit about uh, how CS is impacting um, you know, different disciplines. So it was actually a relatively new program when I was there. Um, oh, obviously, okay. they've got about a decade behind them now as well. Um, so it's, a, it's a neat program. Um, I, uh, I went uh, after Cornell, I went to Electronic Arts, which is a, it's a pretty huge uh, game publisher in the United States. Um, I, it's out in the Bay Area in San Francisco. So I was there for about six years. Uh, I worked on uh, a lot of things at EA. Um, so I worked on their their back end platforms uh, services. I'm a server programmer, sort of by okay. by uh, by chance, I guess that's, that's where my interest lies, and I kind of uh, ended up in mm -hmm. that. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so I worked on that. I worked on um, a really big project. Actually, I moved to Texas for a year and worked on the. Oh, wow. They they shipped a pretty big uh, one of these massively multiplayer online games called uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic in 2011. That was for Bioware out in Texas. So I was there for a year. Went back to the Bay uh, and worked on a couple of mobile games for them. So I worked on uh, a Dragon Age uh, uh, Heroes, or Heroes of Dragon Age, I think is what they called it in the end. Um, mm -hmm. And then I worked on a whole bunch of prototypes for them. Um, and that was up until 2015 when I went to work at Bandai Namco, which is a really big Japanese publisher, yep. Uh, yep. still over here in the US, though I was working for their American uh, division. And uh, primarily focused on mobile development for them. So we worked on the game called Outcast Odyssey and uh, a, a prototype game called uh, Legends Reborn uh, before finally, uh, middle of last year, I uh, left Bandai to start my own studio. So right now that's uh, that's Dopio that, uh, that Jenny mentioned earlier. So we're working on uh, games for the uh, uh, voice platforms like Amazon Alexa. Uh, so I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's uh, that's kind of my career journey in a nutshell. Uh, just been doing a whole bunch of different kind of games and uh, uh, loving it the whole time. <laughs> awesome. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, your major, actually? So it's informational. Sure. 
Yeah, information science. Uh, Cornell actually, in the meantime, has kind of put two of them together. So then it, uh, Cornell now has a faculty of computing and information science as one uh, sort of combined faculty. But uh, yeah, like I was saying earlier, so, uh, what they do is they take a uh, they take the the CS uh, curriculum and they fuse that with things like um, studying the law and technology, studying uh, you know, the history of, of, of CS, studying um, you know basically how uh, how that sort of technical mindset, how the CS mindset um, is applied more broadly in society. And they, they do things like uh, human computer interaction and um, oh, you know wow. the psychology of, of how, how systems work, um, that sort of thing. So it basically gives you, if, if, you're intra if you're really interested in programming and CS, but you have also a broader based interest, which is a lot of, I think it's a lot of people that go to a liberal arts school like Cornell, um, it gives you a, a sort of formal uh, curriculum path to, to sort of, uh, 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 expand your uh, knowledge in, in all of those areas at once. So that was, oh, uh, okay. like I was saying, that was kind of a relatively new program. I think we were the first graduating class in 2009 with, with that department. Um, so, but I mean, I, I just immediately knew, hey, that was that was the right thing for me when I was uh, there. I, I saw that. I'm like, right. yeah, I want to do that. So, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And did you have to take uh, the core CS classes as well? Yeah, it okay. has the same, it has the same core, uh, uh, programming uh you know background so all the all the same like math requirements all the same uh you know programming uh requirements except uh, once you get a little bit later and you can choose to specialize into these different tracks and i, I may, may have changed a bit since i was there um i, I don't i haven't I haven't looked more recently but when i was there there were things like systems programming and mm -hmm. uh hci and the, the sort of uh, design side of it was a, was okay. a track um right so basically right. once you once you more stuff then you just chose sort of, sorts of chose sort of like what the specialty was that, that you want to so mm -hmm. I, I was a systems programmer specialty so uh, I, I was on the more technical track of that because uh, it's still my primary interest but I still appreciated the ability to kind of apply that more broadly right and did you um, did you go to Cornell knowing that you wanted to study information science or like something to uh, relate to CS well yeah I, I definitely knew I wanted to do uh, programming uh, okay did I, mean, you I, have I, I, I Sorry. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I was I was programming since I was a kid. So I mean, basically, oh, okay. I, I was I was uh, five or six when uh, my uncle bought me basically all the parts to build a PC for Christmas one oh, year. Oh wow! <laughs> and we did that as a as a project together. And uh, basically, since then, when I was I was really too young to even know what was going on at that point. But uh, you know, wow. from, from the from the beginning there, I, I you know was really into computers. I I, I had the. Uh, Sort of, sort of happy coincidence of growing up at the same time the internet and the web were getting huge um, in, mm -hmm. in the sort of early mid '90s there. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you know, being there at that point and uh, you know just the concept of having you know, every computer in the world connected and being able to instantly talk to anybody anywhere else uh, right. that that was just so that powerful whole thing for me. Yeah, for sure. So uh, computers and programming that was the gateway into sort of. Uh, you know, producing content and, and, and working in that world that I really love from a really young age. So I, I right. went to Cornell knowing that I wanted to do something with that. Um, I, I didn't know information science existed at the time, so I right. definitely did not know that going in. But, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I went in saying, okay, well, it's probably computer science, but then, you know, the cool thing, I think the cool thing when you're, when you're in a university environment there is you get exposure to all these different uh, things and you, you're able to say, oh, well, actually, I came here wanting to do that, but this thing mm -hmm. is probably better suited for me, so let me, let me go that way instead. So that's kind of where I ended up at, at Cornell. Right. And do you feel like because you had the prior experience um, when you went to Cornell, you were sort of ready to um, kind of tackle like other areas as well? Like you already know um, some of like maybe the basic fundamentals of CS so that you so that you know, like what the potentials could be. And then you wanted to like uh, expand on like breadth of applications. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, that it definitely I mean, obviously, every little bit helps. So, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you go into a college program, if you, if you have if you have uh, exposure to things, you'll you'll be able to grasp concepts, I think, a little bit more quickly just because they're not completely foreign to you at that point. Right. Um, uh, I, I'd say I'd say I didn't have formal CS education before Cornell. So, okay. you know, it was still helpful for me at the beginning to say, oh, OK, well, I've kind of patch these things together, these these programming concepts, just by oh, Chris, algorithms. Your audio, and, sorry, your audio cut off a bit for the past, uh, for like two seconds. Can you repeat what you just said? Okay, well, I was just saying, I, I don't have a formal, I didn't have a formal CS education before getting to Cornell. Um, gotcha. So it was still helpful for me at Cornell to go to the beginning, go to the intro CS courses and learn, okay, well, 
all these sorts of concepts that I've learned by practice, by, by coding, by doing all these things. Okay, these are the formal, you know, ways of thinking about it. Um, and that 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 was sort of uh, helpful there. But definitely, um, having programming not be a completely foreign thing when you get there was was, was, yeah. was super helpful for sure. Gotcha. And um, how did you end up working uh, specifically as a server programmer after college? Like, how did you realize that that was the area that you wanted to dive into? Yeah, well, I mean, like I was saying, I mean, the really the 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 internet and the web, like the early okay. the earliest things that I was ever doing were probably putting web pages together and throwing them up on a on a on a server out there. So it was kind of a natural thing for me, I think, um, right. just you know, figuring out how the internet works and then figuring out, oh, we can we can program things. It's not just static web pages you can throw out there. You can actually make you know computer programs that can talk over the network to each other. Um, mm -hmm. That was. Uh, that was probably okay. the earliest stuff that I was interested in there. So, you know, uh, getting into backend programming and thinking about um, the, you know, things like databases and um, how, how to deal with scale, you know, how to deal with keeping systems up like that. That was probably just a natural, um, what I naturally gravitated towards. Right. And then how did you end up um, realizing that you wanted to focus uh, within the gaming industry? Uh, <clears throat> for me, I think. Uh, I mean, there's there's so many things you can do with with with, with CS. I think um, mm -hmm. I tend to be more product focused, so I I, I, I want to work on things that people use and and, and right. are, are you know affect people's lives on a day to day basis. So, mm -hmm. uh, for me, when when you when you think about that, uh, games are kind of a universal, um, universally appealing thing. Every culture plays games in, yep. in to, to some degree of, of different types of course but right. but it's just such a universally appealing thing for the human right. condition that you know right. I, I, it's really hard to, to find something that 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 uh that'll that'll uh give you the opportunity to affect as many lives as, as that so that that's what that's what drew me towards games like oh well yeah i mean i can i love games i know that i love games and i know that it's just such a big thing for everybody in the world so let me mm -hmm. uh, let me see what i can do there and um, right, it connects yeah. people together. It's like it's uh, you can create a whole huge community based off of um, one game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's it's not just one game either, right? It's you know, I, I might like you know the role playing games, but you know, lots of people uh, nowadays, anyway, in particularly. I mean, you, there's so many people that that uh, would be taken aback when I call them a gamer, but then I look at their phone and they're playing Scrabble or they're playing some kind of a match three game. Everybody, <laughs> everybody has some kind of a game that they've, they've probably played at some point or at some point right. in their lives. So, you know, right, right, right. That, that's kind of exactly what I'm talking about is there, there's probably some kind of a game because it's just such a, just such a human thing, right, to, to mm -hmm. want to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, engage with that level. Um, right. The product. And, and yeah, and different types of games, yeah, uh, different people are drawn to based on like maybe the storytelling or the problem solving. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, and there's so many options out there. Um, and also, how did your uh, education help with uh, you co-founding, uh, co-finding Dopio Games? Um, I mean, I, I, it's um, yeah, obviously the, the the practical thing we're doing is creating software. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 a uh, it's we're not making board games here, right? We're like we're, right, we're, right. we're we're making video games, which are which is computer software in the end. So. Um, you can't do that really without without the background in NCS. Yeah. Some so that's, that's that's kind of influenced me my, my whole career. Um, and certainly now at uh, at Topio, um, I work with my my co-founder, um, who's the, our CEO, who does the more business you know end of things. Uh, you know, uh, and he's also a, he's a pretty great game designer too. I think everybody's a little bit of a game designer to be honest, like mm -hmm. in, in anything like that. But uh, but yeah, in terms of uh, what we call software engineering, I'm the only software engineer I think because we're a two-person shop, right? So right now, um, yeah. I'm relying completely on my skill set to to allow us to have products at all right now. Oh wow! Um, so it's certainly like I I wouldn't be able to do um, what I do today without you know, that that background. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, was the transition from um, from going to Cornell um, and then to working professionally was that uh, was it a pretty seamless transition like you had um, pro possibly had like internship experience or like what you had, had learned did it transfer directly to um, your professional life yeah um, I worked um, at Cornell I actually worked at the uh, there's, there's a student newspaper at Cornell called the Daily Sun um, and okay. they uh, they have a website um, so a lot of what I did uh, as a student at Cornell was a uh, I work in that department. I was the web editor at the paper for a number of years, and uh, you know, 
kind of got some firsthand uh, practical <laughs> software development experience in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in situ there. If that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I did. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the key thing that you that you learn um, when you take your first job going out of uh, out of a you know, university program like that is is sort of the the distinction between computer science and software engineering. Um, so software mm -hmm. engineering is a, is a really uh, you could think of it as sort of the practical application of CS to, to creating uh, products, and and there's a lot of uh, things that you need to learn experientially. I think with uh, with, with software engineering that um, you know, that go beyond the you know because I mean okay in a CS program you learn you learn what the algorithms are you learn mm -hmm. data structures you learn you know how how to put code together, but there's a lot in software engineering in terms of how to work in a team of people um, how to you know collaborate with folks mm -hmm. um, how to uh, Think about your code as a as a artifact that needs to be maintained over a long period of time. That maybe not, not only needs to be maintained by you, but by other people. Um, mm -hmm. so, so thinking in terms of maintainability and readability of the code that you're producing, mm -hmm. um, those are sorts of the practical skills that you develop as a software engineer that you might not. You might, I mean, you could get it through internships and things like that when you're in university, right. but uh, you know, right. you really need to get out of the academic setting and into a into a more practical software engineering team before you start to see. Uh, these these gaps. So that 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 was that's the biggest challenge I think coming out of out of university is, is sort of shifting from an academic context into a more practical uh, uh, software engineering context um, mm -hmm. and building those skills up. So that 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 when you look at a new software engineer coming out of school, those are probably the things that are going to be missing that you're probably going to have to help them develop. Um, and right. I, I that was certainly the case for me for sure. Right, right, and it's it's like you have to um, get used to working in a team, and it's like it's a very yeah. social. Um, thing where you have to like make sure to uh, that what you you end up coding is like legible to other people as well it's not just uh, make sense to you <laughs> yeah I mean, I mean just the things like uh, uh, having a having a stakeholder in the thing that you're developing that is not yourself right mm. that's a really different way of thinking about things it's like okay I, I am making this thing but um, Really, we need to satisfy the requirements that are coming from this other person, this other group over here, um, mm -hmm. and and figuring out how to communicate with people that are not even in your own team, but that are still stakeholders in the product you're developing. Like that, that's a that's a skill set, right? That that um, is really outside of the realm of CS. But you know, if you're going to be working as a practical software engineer, you're going to need those skills, and that's you know, those are sort of the things that you'll develop uh, on the job. You know, right. in, in your, your internships or your first uh, jobs out of school. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, and I guess, like, uh, the next question, uh, what do you like most about CS? And you've sort of talked about this, like, the, um, like how uh, computers are connected and you're able to, like, uh, be able to uh, push changes really easily and, like, iterate on that and have, um, like, the sort of immediate feedback and also have, like, um, all, the, all of these, uh, like, uh, computers that are interconnected. Um, but is there anything? Is there a favorite subject that you had, or uh, when you were at school, or even currently? Um, I mean, I, to, to me, the the in a nutshell, you, you can think of CS as uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit like magic. If you, if you take a step back, you can you can write these words into the computer and make things happen, and uh, that, mm -hmm. that's just a viscerally you know appealing thing. I, I think. Um, yeah, as a, if I was a writer or an artist, like I can create. Something, um, you know, that, right. that is that is inherently creative, uh, but ultimately, like, that's something you need to give to somebody, and, and it only comes to life through their own perception. With software, I, I can make a computer do things, right? Like, for, practically, like, I can I can make it do things that you can see um, in, in a reproducible way, and, and to me, like, that that's that's what gets me uh, you know, going on a day to day basis. It's like, hey, we're we're making we're actually making a product here um, that right. uh, we can give to people. Like, right, it's, right. It's, 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 it's a it's a it's as close as you can get to making a physical thing without, you know, having to learn you know, carpentry or, 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 you know, metalworking. Or, 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 right. You know, we're still working with bits and, and bytes, but you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a it's it's a practical thing that does that does something. And it, to me, like that's the that's sort of the craft of it uh, to go with the, the sort of science of, you know, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And Jackson, Rachel, are those also the reasons why um, you like you you guys are interested in CS as well? Um, do you guys have anything to add about like being able to create something out of nothing and it's almost like magic? I mean, there's also like a therapeutic element to it. Oh, how so? It's 
it's kind of calming, I guess. I, okay. I, it's, it's hard not to stressful. <laughs> it's kind of hard to uh, describe, but I agree. It's, it's definitely relaxing sometimes. Okay. And uh, I also agree with Chris. It's fun to be able to make something without making something physically. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a creative outlet. Um, you know, I think that that's it's it's an opportunity because like, I mean, yeah, I, I like like we were we were uh, we were joking a little bit earlier before the thing started. Is I I can't draw to save my life, um, you know. I but yeah, so you know when I when I try and I, I can't I can't play an instrument that great. I can't I can't sing that great, but I, I can write code. Like I so I could. That's kind of my creative outlet. Is like hey, I can realize these things in in, in code. And I think that's a pretty neat thing. Right. Um, okay. Cool. Uh, I. I just received the question of what is CS. Uh, CS is uh, computer science. Um, okay, so next slide. Uh, so this was uh, the section is specifically um, about your career. Um, and so first question. Um, so I, I've asked this uh, on the previous slide. Why did you want to work in the game industry? Um, but uh, is there anything that maybe like you haven't elaborated on that you'd like to add to this? As in, um, is there anything about the industry specifically that that you're super, you're very drawn to, like maybe new innovations, um, uh, being able to like experiment with different uh, types, like ways that you can play games? Yeah, it's it's a it's a cool time to be in the games industry uh, in particular. Um, uh, it's probably true generally in society as well, but but mm -hmm. in games in particular, it's, you know, the the neat thing right now is that you know everybody's connected to the internet. You know, we all have smartphones in our pockets that are you know constantly uh, uh, able to pull new software down from, from the from the web from servers. Um, so as a game developer, that that's a really cool and powerful concept because you know, we can. Uh, and, and I mean, I, I, we might we might talk a little bit more about it later, but you know. Just, just getting that feedback with getting, getting concepts in front of people and getting feedback and being able to iterate on that is, is so critical. And mm -hmm. I, I, there's probably never been a time in history where you know you've been able to do that as, as quickly and effectively as you can do it right now. Um, mm -hmm. So right. you know, to me, like that, that, that's a, it's a really cool thing because you know we can, we can really cheaply uh, create a concept or a small game for, for, a, for an iPhone, for instance, and get it out there in front of people and, and you know, immediately get feedback on that. Um, mm -hmm. Rather than having to uh, convince a bunch of executives to commit a whole lot of money to developing something and printing discs and shipping boxes out the stores and mm -hmm. doing, you know the whole marketing, like we can actually short circuit a lot of that, uh, you know, up front and you know maybe find find a cool new idea uh, faster or more mm -hmm. cheaply you know, than we could mm -hmm. do before. Mm -hmm. That's kind of right. a new time uh, in particular right now. Yeah, <laughs> right, definitely. Um, yeah, and. Being able to like push new versions really fast and get your ideas affirmed, so that that yeah. is that is super effective. Yep. Um, and also, what are some current trends in, in the gaming industry now? We were talking a little bit about this earlier uh, before we had started uh, the webinar, but voice control. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll talk about talk about voice uh, a ton because that that is literally the, my company right now is literally yeah. doing <laughs> doing voice yeah. games. That's probably yeah. the newest thing. Uh, you know. Uh, so you know, you might have like a, an Alexa, um, you know, Amazon Echo in your house. You might have a Google, uh, you know, home device. You probably have something like Siri on your phone, or or, or you know, a Google Assistant if you've got an Android. Uh, voice uh, control is everywhere. It's it's being powered by you know a, a sort of explosion in machine learning. Uh, just the, the modernization of that and uh, you know, the the ability of, of computers to understand uh, you know the sounds that you make with your voice and. Uh, <laughs> and the text and then also take that text and discern meaning from it um the tools to do that have never been better i mean they've mm -hmm. never been more available um so we're at the point now where you know i as a game developer can say okay what are the cool things that we can do if we consider voice to be the primary input method rather than you know touch or uh, control mm -hmm. or something like that um right. that that's that's um i'd say that's really really new um right now that a lot of like a lot of the games that are out there um if you have an Alexa, you might not even know, know that you can play games like that, but you can. There's there's literally tons oh, wow. of thousands of, of skills out there that play all kinds of different games. So I'd check that out. Okay. Uh, there's, you know, uh, what we're doing right now is, is sort of exploring. Okay, what what happens if we take a more traditional game design background um, and all the experience that we have from doing AAA development, and we bring that over here and we do bigger uh, games that are that are voice driven. So that's uh, 
that's mm-hmm. that's that's my my day to day right now. My my, my passion is, is figuring that stuff out. That's our my startup. Mm-hmm. Uh, more broadly, I mean, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening. Um, obviously, I think the biggest shift in the last decade has been the, the rise of the smartphone. Everybody has mm-hmm. a phone now, whereas 10 years yep. ago that was probably not true. Right. Uh, yeah. That that changed everything. You know. Right. <laughs> right. Because right now, uh, you know, before you might have needed to sit down at a PC or sit down at a gaming console and you know boot into a gaming experience. You know, boot the console up, start mm-hmm. put a disc in, uh, and there's a lot of friction to that. With a phone, we can think about smaller experiences that you maybe play for a couple minutes throughout the day. Um, things mm-hmm. like a scrab- like a board game, like a Scrabble or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. It, 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 so mobile has has totally uh, changed the approach that you know, but even big companies take to game development just because uh, it's it's sort of grown the user base of potential gamers by by orders of magnitude. It's like it, it's it's almost literally the entire world <laughs> that you have right. access to. This right, 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 on your device. Powerful thing. Yeah, um, or, or you can get it, pick up a Google Cardboard, um, and then you can put your phone literally like inches, an inch away from your eyes, and you can do VR. Well, that was that was the next the <laughs> next trend that I want to, yep. to mention. Is of course, uh, uh, virtual reality is is uh, is I think probably the the biggest thing. If you go to a, if you go to a conference of game developers, uh, you, you, it's pretty hard to to throw a stone and not hit somebody that's doing some of the VR. Um, it's it's uh, <laughs> and Jackson it's, has one right there. Oh uh, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> For, for people who don't know what VR is, yes, <laughs> you have a screen inches away from your eyes. <laughs> yeah, so which is, I mean, VR has been around forever. Um, it, okay. it's, it's it's been a dream, you know, going back to you know, if you ever watch Star Trek and you have the holodeck, right? Like it's just such a really like uh, cool thing. <laughs> we just have, to, I think, right now at this moment in, in time, we have the technology to get put it in a product that you can buy and not need to devote an entire room of your house to creating a. A VR cave or something like that. It's literally just a goggle you can put on your on your head and, and, and jump into one of these experiences. Or or like you were saying with like cardboard or daydream or you know gear VR. Like there there are all these like small things that you can literally just take your phone up. But you which again everybody has a phone. So you can take that mm-hmm. phone, put it into one of these things, and and not even need special hardware for it. So that's a yeah. pretty cool uh, thing that a lot of people in games are thinking about. And related to VR, there's also AR or augmented yeah. reality, um, which is a little bit less. Uh, Less well defined, but essentially it's 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 creating experiences that fuse the digital and the real world together. So um, probably the, the the biggest the, uh, AR experience that, that you might have uh, had some exposure to is uh, Pokemon Go, which was really huge like maybe a year year ago. I mean, it's still, yep. it's still one of the biggest games. Like I think they just raised uh, a valuation of like four billion dollars that, that that company that, that made that one. But uh, oh my yeah, gosh. So basically that, that that's an AR game where you can. Um, you can go around and it actually uses the GPS in your phone yeah. to uh, use the location you have in the real world that to send feedback into the game experience and, and affects like what, what Pokemon that you can catch uh, depending on where you walk in the world. So that's an example of, uh, of AR where it's not it's not that I'm putting a helmet on and, and sort mm-hmm. of immersing myself in this virtual world, but I'm taking the virtual world into the real world and sort of fusing those things together. So VR and AR are huge <laughs> right now, uh, and a lot of people are, are thinking about them, for sure. Right, right. And recently I've seen AR uh, used in tourism. Um, you could, uh, within like a, a museum, you can have it like overlaid on top of certain uh, yeah. sets, and then it would show you like stuff that's uh, on your screen, like information about what you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, it's, so. it's so cool right now because these, these phones have so many sensors in them with regards to uh, gyroscopes and, and the GPS that I was mm-hmm. talking about. Uh, and they have uh, a lot of them have multi-camera arrays. They can kind of do, um, they can detect the 3Dness of the world, detect uh, you know oh, wow. objects in their positioning and find surfaces. So that those those overlays can be really real. Like it's not just yeah. a, like a hokey little like billboarded uh, piece of graphic, but it, it actually can kind of sort of create the illusion of creating a 3D object in the world that you're actually in. Uh, yeah, and that's yeah. getting better and better by the day, it seems. Uh, and the tools to to do work with that are getting better. So you know. As it becomes easier to do, more people do it, and it gets better. And so that's we're seeing this sort of uh, virtuous cycle right now. This sort of feedback loop where, where stuff's getting better and better so quickly. Wow. So. Yeah, that's fascinating. Hold for AR with the with the uh, the positioning of like the angle of the character be also uh, synonymous to the actual environment that you're pointing at. Um, like with the yeah. shadow casted be the right direction as like where the sun is. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. Yeah, they, they, they actually they can take the. Um, uh, I'm I'm more familiar with the with the Apple side of things, but um, oh, okay. they have a uh, part of their system platform that can actually read the lighting information in the world and light oh, wow. the object 
as if it was actually there, right? So it can find you know where the prominent light source is in the world and and uh, correctly uh, cast a shadow in the right direction and and and, and shade the the object correctly so that it looks like um, it, it's actually there, uh, sort of on the table. And they have um, they have persistent uh, memory of location too, so we can actually uh, imagine like a game where you can go out in the world and uh, you know I can drop a virtual object at this cafe, and then if you go there go there later. And point your phone at it. You'll see the object that I put there at that same place in the same angle. You know, oh uh, it, it's just it's a cool uh, concept of, of uh, you know opening right. up new opportunities for, for gameplay experiences like that. So that, that right. that's that's getting so so huge right now, and there's there's so much more content coming available for that. Yeah, and I think this is also a great point. Uh, I realize that we haven't we've talked about it before the webinar, but um, can you actually talk about Dopio Games um, and uh, specifically also about the new game that you guys launched which is the vortex um and also about like the how the interaction is very unique um because it's voice controlled yeah so so i mean we're uh we're we're on amazon alexa which is a smart speaker um it comes um it comes in two shapes the the main one that most people have is uh the really cheap echo dot which is just a little like hockey puck that's basically just a speaker and microphone <laughs> they yep. go together they do have some of them that also have screens that are it's the echo show and the echo spot they they're uh, like a small round screen a big rectangular screen okay, right. um but primarily it's a voice experience because that's to run on like the majority of the install base just has these smart speakers so when you think about game experiences on that that that'll work in an audio only context um the way we came to that is to say um, it needs to focus around uh, talking around around the concept of uh, conversational gameplay um, mm -hmm. using using audio as the input. So in our game is our game was the Vortex. We we shipped it in October, so it's been out for a couple of months now. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, so in, in that game you you kind of wake up on a spaceship that's uh, sort of been abandoned in space. These these robots wake you up and they're like, hey, all the people are gone. What what's going on? So. Um, uh -huh. You're stuck in you're stuck in this uh, this uh, sort of cryostasis pod and not able to move, which actually mirrors you know the ability the agency that you have in the game itself, right? Because you're just uh -huh. talking to this device, uh -huh. uh, and the, the way you explore the ship and find out what happened is by talking to these robots and asking them to go do things for you, and then they come back and report you know what they're seeing, what they're hearing, and you can kind of ask them questions, ask them to go do things for you, um, and just, the game sort of sort of sort of unfolds like that. So for us, it was a design exercise of figuring out. Uh, what makes sense um, given the, the platform's capabilities and, 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 and uh, you know uh, limit, limitations, right? which is right. generally you know a good a good. It, it's generally good when you're developing uh, a product to, to think about hey, what what is the what is the experience my customers are actually going to have, and let's play to the strengths and, and sort of you know yeah. avoid the weaknesses. You'll you'll end yeah. up with a better product that way. But uh, yeah, you know, for us. Like that, that is that's the core mission statement for Dopio is to actually do uh, conversational games that explore um, relationships and, 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 and uh, you know interpersonal um, you know development. And so for <laughs> us, like it, it really just it's right in our sweet spot of like hey, this is exactly the kind of thing we want to do, and these devices play really well to the strengths of the of the kinds of games they want to be developing. So yeah, check out the Vortex if you haven't. It's, yeah. uh, it's on Alexa. You can actually just say, Alexa, open the Vortex, and it should uh, fire right up for you if you've got one of those devices. <laughs> oh, that's so that's so cool. And do you play with other uh, players, or is it uh, is the interpersonal part, uh, it's you and the, the robots that are in the game? Uh, the Vortex is a single player game. It's, um, it's we're, single player. Uh, we're really interested in doing multiplayer. Um, it was okay. a little bit too much to bite off for our very first one, right. but uh, we're, we're, we're exploring those, uh, those concepts for our future titles for sure. Okay, cool. And can you give an example of what the maybe the first few like first minute of the interaction would be? Like, what do you what would you actually you you would say Amazon uh, or uh, Alexa open um, vor the vortex, and then would it like talk to you about like describe the scene in a really vivid way, um, and then like kind of get you into the the zone and like picture the environment? Yeah, so we we kind of we kind of wrote a little uh, intro uh, scene um, where yeah the there's a, 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 a an AI character that, that runs okay. like the cryo bay that you're in that explains to you uh, what's going on and sort of it sort it sort of starts to ask you questions. Um, uh, you know, pr the idea is that it's kind of waking up from from sleep, so it's okay. asking you questions to gauge your your mental state to see how how well you come out of it. But along along the way of asking these questions, you're kind of learning about the the environment and, and what you've been in, and you kind of you kind of start to figure out the machine is malfunctioning a little bit, 
itself. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> yeah, and so then... that, that's kind of the, the early moments of the game is just interacting with this um with this character, and uh, you know, eventually that you, know, you you meet the main characters that you'll be playing with uh you know, after that initial scene. Okay, and then what is the uh, what is the goal um, for the game, or how do you win? Well, it's it yes, yeah, it's it's a it's a story driven game, right? So really, your 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 aim is to figure out what happened, and I mean, ultimately, what you want to do is get out of that cryo bay and uh, and uh, you know uh, go out and get home or explore the universe, or whatever your your uh, own goals that you think that are. But uh, your main your your I primary see. objective is hey, I'm stuck here. I need to figure out a way to reboot the ship or or whatever it is to. To get out of here, um, and I, you need to work with these robots on the ship to, to do that because you're you're stuck. So that's uh, right. That's the, okay. that's the initial picture. That's all. It, it kind of it, it kind of unfolds a little bit from, from there, of course. But uh, uh, yeah. yeah, that's I, that's, the, that's the back of the box. Right. That <laughs> sounds so fascinating. Yeah. If right, I have a Google Home, but um, if I do get myself an Amazon Echo, I would definitely try that out. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're we're bringing it we're bringing it to more things, uh, you know, as quickly as we can. Just yeah, it is a uh, we're 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 uh, you know, the Alexa was our first uh, one, but uh, you know, we're 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 um, we're interested in bringing this to as many people as possible uh, gotcha. in, in the near future. Yep, I'm I'm look I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Cool. And then, what are some of the um, oh, what are some of the pitfalls you've had? So I guess um, I'm sure it's not as completely smooth sailing journey. What, what are some of the primary pitfalls you've had with the, the design process um, or development process? Yeah, the 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 games have a unique problem um, as compared with uh, you know other types of software you might develop in that it's it's pretty hard to define what what is fun like if, if i ask mm. you what is what is fun like our, our our main our main goal is to make a fun game right like we right. We, we, we fail if, if the game is not fun and people don't like it but the problem is that if i ask you what is fun uh and i ask jackson mm -hmm. what is fun and i ask some people from the audience what is fun they everyone's gonna have a different answer for that um right so it's really it's really hard to uh balance everyone's by that and, mm -hmm. and, and create a you know one right answer um so the it's really a, it, that's really the art aspect of, of game design is is uh, we need to we get these crazy ideas we don't know if anyone's gonna like them um, and we need to realize them uh, in, in prototype form whether it's software or whether it's uh, physical prototypes or like there's there's so many different ways to do that um, I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier that it's a, it's a cool time to be doing game development because it's so easy to get software in front of people right now because mm -hmm. can just get it through app stores and, and the web. Um, right. The, the or you could user test. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, that's what I'm saying. User testing is so easy right now. It's, yeah, it's so easy yeah. for me to, you know, we, I could take my team and spend like two or three weeks and put put a pretty good, you know, a sort of decently good prototype together and then actually mm -hmm. get that in front of real people and get real feedback, which right, is so right, much right. better than, you know, us just playing internally and, and, and uh, the more diverse people that look at it and uh, the better feedback you're going to get. And it's so easy right now with the web and with app stores and, and uh, you know, those sorts of channels to, to, to do that kind of testing. So, right. Um, exactly. That, 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 that is the primary uh, challenge in game design is like, you, you don't know, you, you really don't know front if it's, if it's meeting your primary requirement to hey, is this a fun game that people are actually going to like to play. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. yep. So yeah, that, that, that is a, uh, and I mean, like honestly, sometimes the answer is that uh, no. It, you know, we had this idea and it, we went with it, and it wasn't fun. So we need to shelve this and, and do something else, or you know, take 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 some of the good pieces of it and apply those to a different design later. Um, and right, that that means right. you, you need to you need to be realistic that hey, that might be the answer. Like this might not be the right concept, and um, and be okay with pivoting. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Not not get too uh, married to the to the, the first idea that you have in your head because yeah, it might. The answer might be it's not it's not a good idea. Like it, that 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 was better in my head than than it, you know it is in practice. That's what sort of thing you know. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next slide because we're at 7:40 and we're a little bit strapped with time. Sure. Um, okay. So the next uh, this section is more so um, parent questions that uh, that parents frequently ask us. Um, so this one, uh, the first one, my son spends too much time playing games. How do I redirect his efforts into coding instead? Um, yeah. yeah. So, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, yeah. I mean, I, the, there there are a couple of a couple of ways to look at this. Um, I, I have I have three proposals. Uh, one is I, I think I think the way a lot of people get into uh, 
to, to programming game development is uh, through through modding. Um, there's certainly a lot of games that are more open to this than others. But mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking of things like uh, like Minecraft, um, right. where you might start by connecting to somebody's server and playing the stock game, but you know, very quickly, you know, through the community, you'll you'll learn that hey, there's ways to extend the software to make it do things that it didn't do before. And there's tons of material and tons of uh, things like that that are available. I know, you know, uh, when I was a kid, uh, you know, the, the you know I played a lot of strategy games like StarCraft and you know Age mm -hmm. of Empires that sort of thing. And uh, there was a very vibrant uh, uh, modding scene where a, there there's a product that somebody made, but we can actually create new content and uh, for it. Um, and right. and that that's that's sort of a natural way to get into. Uh, thinking about game systems and thinking about programming uh, scripting in some areas uh you know how to how to take this thing that exists and make it do things that it didn't do before which you know right. it, it, it's sort of a gentler way to been creating something entirely from scratch so that's that's mm -hmm. one way mm -hmm. um yeah another way is there are games that are programming games um that and you know the, uh, two examples that come to mind that i yeah, i've played myself recently and enjoyed are uh, the game called human resource machine uh, and uh, mm -hmm. its sequel, Seven Billion Humans. Uh, these are games by the Tomorrow Corporation. Um, they're available on everything, so iPhone, Android, Nintendo, uh, PC. They're 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 everywhere. Um, and these are games that actually will teach you the core concepts of programming uh, oh, through wow. a game. Um, uh huh. Uh -huh. So may, may that one one other way to look at it might be to say, okay, well, why don't you try this game? Because um, they're actually they're actually pretty fun. They're they're actually pretty well designed fun games, but what they're what you're really doing uh, in in human resource machine is learning uh, procedural programming, like how to actually put instructions together, how to think about flow control and state management, and all the things that you'd learn in a programming language. But in this case, you're you're sort of commanding these little drones around to, to go do things visually for you on the screen. So it ends up, and this is a mobile uh, game. It's it's mobile console PC. Oh. It's, it's they, okay. they've put it on literally every platform under the sun, so you can play it however you want. Okay. Um, and then the, the sequel, Seven Billion Humans, is, is neat because they actually start to teach you multi-threaded programming, which is uh, it, it's a crazy concept, and a lot of professional software engineers don't do a good job with it. Um, but uh -huh. they they found a way in that game to really uh, you know uh, make those concepts uh, uh, approachable. <laughs> so okay, what, I, sorry, what is that called again? It's called Seven Billion Humans. Okay, so and it's the same company. So uh, if you find one, they're probably right next to each other in the store. Okay. Uh, and then the third thing, the third thing I'd recommend looking at is if you have an iPad, uh, Apple has a, has a piece of software called Swift Playgrounds. Um, that's a really cool thing uh, because that that'll teach you the practical language that's used to do iOS development mm -hmm. uh, through a series of uh, again visually oriented tutorials um, that, that sort of build in complexity. And then you know once you graduate from the tutorials, you can actually just it's a Swift programming environment that you can actually use to put put apps together. So um, that's another really approachable, well-designed piece of software. Um, so if you have an iPad, you could put that in front of a student and say, hey, look at this, uh, just play with it. And these are really cool things that, because all three of these things I think are really cool because they're, they can, um, you can give it to the to the kid and, and say, hey, this is something I can do, you can do on your own. Like you can right. be sort of self-guided with this and um, rather than being sort of more heavy handed with, with anything. Um, and, and also it sort of keeps you in a gaming context, which is, which is I think uh, pretty appealing. Yeah, that's like the best of both worlds, educational yeah. and it's fun. <laughs> For sure. Awesome. Um, and then another question uh, that's frequently asked, actually, which is what the difference is between playing games and making games. Oh uh, well, I don't think you can make games without playing them. I, I think I think uh, one universal constant. But the game you know industry is really really people with diverse backgrounds and. Uh, Coming mm -hmm. into it from all walks of life and all sorts of experiences, but the one common thread I think you'll find in every place that everyone likes to play games. Uh, <laughs> is yep. it's, it's really rough in the business of making software for things that you actually don't like to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, the, going to the first question, I think like yeah, you, you need to have that uh, broad exposure to lots of different kinds of games and to figure out what what you know you like and what you don't like and what other kinds of people like and what they don't like. Um, but uh, once you start to get into the concept of making games, what you find is that you start to think about um, games differently. You start to, which is I think probably the same as you, you know, if you write movie scripts and then you go watch TV or a movie and you, mm -hmm. you kind of start to see behind the curtain a little bit, start to think about uh, how this thing was built. Like what, what are the actual design decisions that went into making this thing? Because this, this is not a thing that popped out of thin air. This is a product that people made 
the people thought about this and they made decisions. Um, so you start to kind of break it down and, and, and think a little bit more deeply about uh, about uh, right. how it was built. So it really, to me, it's the difference between uh, letting letting the experience wash over you and then sort of uh, thinking more critically about hey, how it was put together and and then what you like and don't like about it. That's that's the key. That's the key difference, I think, for me. <laughs> Gotcha. And do you think that being, uh, building games can make you a better gamer? That's just my question. But I just... well, <laughs> I, I'd say no, probably. No. Okay. I, think, I think oftentimes you'll find that developers of a game are actually not all that good at playing it because a lot of these games take a lot of uh, you know practice and, and effort to get good at. And you know, when you're not playing it. 24 7 365 it becomes difficult to get really good at it so i they, they're not necessarily directly up in that way right right, right. <laughs> cool um and also for the parents um out there who are trying to dis disincentivize their kids from playing games what are the advantages that you think there are to playing games <clears throat> yeah so i mean I, there's two two ways i'd go with this one is uh uh it, Playing playing games, uh, it can teach you how systems work, um, wh which is I think a really valuable skill in life in general because we live in a society that is defined by a whole bunch of systems that are interacting with, with each other. Really, um, you mm -hmm. know, so when you play games, like again, like this is a product that was designed by people that made decisions. Um, there's generally these underlying systems that are that are influencing how the game environment works, and playing games uh, can teach you to think about. You know, hey, how how does this? What are the rules of this thing, and how do I make it work? It's my advantage. Uh, that that's I think a pretty valuable skill, generally even outside of game development or or, or playing games at all. So, <laughs> to me, that's one thing. And then the other thing is again, like uh, uh, there's the whole concept of the social dynamics of, of, of how a game works. Um, you know, uh, there's a there's a popular buzzword that that you may run into called gamification. Um, yes. So. And this is really a, a way to get people to do things that they might not otherwise want to do. <laughs> to create <laughs> by, the, by, the by habit maybe, loop. Right. Basically, you know, we can take, we, if there's an unpleasant thing like you know, doing chores or something like that, right. we, or, or let's say like getting healthy, like like you want to do more, uh, you know, workouts, go to the gym more often or something like that, right? right? Um, yeah, a, 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 a way, to, uh, an inherent way to get people to do that is to sort of take some elements from gameplay and bring it over to that, um, and and people inherently engage more with that. So, you know, playing games lets you uh, learn more about those dynamics and how they work and how you might think about how you might apply those into the other scenarios. So, you know, a there there's achievements over here. So let's let's create these these sort of definable milestones with progress. That's a universal. Your game concept that can work anywhere. Um, so mm -hmm. playing games gets you into thinking about those social dynamics of hey, how how people's brains work and how you can kind of hack them a little bit to, get, to, get <laughs> to do things <laughs> do things for you than what other others want to do. Uh, no, don't manipulate people. That is bad. <laughs> uh, it's, it's in a, it's in a good way. It's in a good way though. Right? <laughs> in a strategic way. Yeah. Yeah. Make the world so, make the world a little bit better with some of these game elements. Yeah. Yeah. And then have people like pining for rewards. <laughs> And that's how you yeah. have them do stuff. <laughs> um, Jackson, do you have anything, any, any uh, feedback for for people? I know that you um, also really. What do you play now? Fortnite. No, no, no I don't. <laughs> uh, it's fine. All right, moving on. Um, before we move on, though, uh, Jackson, Rachel, do you guys have any questions that you'd like to ask um, before we move on to the, the work section where uh, Rachel has a lot of her questions? Oh, um, th this is just uh, a question related to gaming industry in general. So the general trend for the past couple of years has been this, sur this surge of like indie games, which have been deconstructions of what gaming is. And how do you think it's going to, what direction do you think it's going to take in the future? Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of indie games. Uh... Oh, sorry, Rachel. Can you elaborate? Uh, you mean do you mean specifically for indie games? Oh, I I, I was just asking like in I, I guess for indie games, yes, specifically. Um, how like what what do you what do you envision the gaming industry for small time creators will be in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, well, certainly, like, I, I, I am running an indie studio right now, so I have, <laughs> I, I, I'm in the middle of, of doing some of it. At home. Um, I, I think, I think it all goes back to, to what I was saying earlier about how the market has changed. Um, it, with, with, um, with things like with uh, smartphones and the web, uh, 
being so ubiquitous, uh, access to to players has been effectively democratized. Like you can go download Unity, throw a game together, and put it on the App Store, and people can be playing it all over the world. You know, in a matter of weeks. Right? Like it's it's anybody can do it. It's not there's no special uh, you know gatekeepers or anything like that to, to keep you out of that. So to me, like that that's that's changed the market dramatically. That you know, it's not just big companies like like EA. With that, with you know, multi-billion-dollar you know uh, budgets to, to, to be working on this thing, it's like anybody can do it. And and the cool thing is, um, that means that you get a lot more diverse types of games. Um, people that get crazy ideas in their in their garage can just throw stuff together. Uh, and if if you don't like a type of game, just keep looking because there's probably another one out there that you will like. There's so there's just <laughs> such a diversity of, of concepts. So, so to me, like that's uh, that that's the really cool thing about indie development right now is that. Yeah, the, we're we're not just constrained by you know uh, big AAA public company profitability uh, standards, which tend to produce one sort of game. Like there's just such an explosion and diversity of different types of, of games, and I think that's pretty cool because everybody likes different things, and you know now mm -hmm. you can you can probably find something out there. And if you don't, you can probably make it. Let's make it yourself. Available. <laughs> Definitely. Um, we actually don't have too much time left. It's like it's 7:53. Um. Uh, people in the audience, if you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to uh, post it. Uh, it's within the, the chat box on the, the right-hand side. Um, so the next few slides are going to be, I guess, more specific to um, the development process at W Games, and I think uh, these are more like, like company-specific and also more technical. Uh, so if parents, you guys have any questions uh, for Chris, feel free to ask it now. Um, and I'll be monitoring the question section. So uh, Rachel, if you would like to take over from here. I mean, I, I, those are some of the questions I sent over. If, if there mm -hmm. are any interesting ones you'd like to elaborate on, yeah, you can, I guess, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the question of uh, what the development process is like is, is an interesting one. I mean, it, it's really different now. Um, Adopio is, is two people right now. So like I said earlier, it's, it's me and my, my, my partner. And so we work just together. When, when you have a team that's that small, it's, it's really easy to just talk to the other person you're working with mm -hmm. and they have yeah. sort of... Uh, uh, full stage shared between it but like i was also saying like I, I i've worked at really big companies on really big projects so you know like the the older public was literally probably over a thousand people spread over so many locations in the world like basically the entirety of ea was working on that game <laughs> to some degree everywhere in, on, on earth so uh but you know so, so you know when, when you think about how to how to make stuff work with a team like that um Really, it ends up being a, a, a question of dividing up the project into smaller chunks and then coordinating uh, the smaller chunks. So basically, you just want to make sure that every person is not overwhelmed by the entire scope of this massive thing that you might be building. Like, you want to be able to get people to just think about um, their piece of it and then, you know, create a you know sort of interaction layer. It's really, it really is similar to the way you design software, I mean, where you uh, you abstract the different functions of, of the program. Uh, and then let each part sort of work well individually. Uh, so you know, with, with uh, but you know, on a broader level, the, the what you'll find with most games is there's a prototyping phase where you know, hey, we're let's, we're trying to find hey, what what is the fun? <laughs> that's the question that's what I was talking about earlier. Is like <laughs> hey, uh, out of all the possible infinite things that we could do, what what are some cool ideas that we think might be fun? And let's prototype that and just see if it passes muster internally. Uh, once we get a good idea, we'll take that and develop that a little bit farther to a point that we'll call the first playable milestone, uh, which is basically like let's build. Most games are a combination of loops where you know the player does something and gets some reward, and then takes that reward and does something else, and then that sort of feeds back into itself. So what we'll try and do is build one of those loops out uh, into something that we can share outside of the team and get more feedback at that point. Um, mm -hmm. At a big company, at that point, that's when you'll go to the executive and show it and say, "Hey, this is the kind of thing we want to build. Can we get money to do that?" <laughs> uh, and then yeah, they'll once they once they're happy with that, that'll get approved. You'll go into production, which is the bulk of it. Like that's where okay. you'll bring a lot of people onto it, uh, start to produce all the game code, all the content that goes into it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then eventually, what you're building towards is the alpha milestone, which is the point where all the software features of the game are done. You might not have all the content, all the art and sound and, and that sort of thing, but the software feature of the game should probably be done at that point. Uh, and then okay. after that is the beta milestone where we'll do all the content. Um, 
Uh, and then for mobile for mobile games uh, and, and the internet, what we have is a, a, the ability to do a soft launch at that point, to take the game and put it out into like Australia or, or Canada, like pick, pick a, a couple of these Great countries time. and get it out there to real customers <laughs> and test in the market. And that a lot, an average game will actually spend a long time in soft launch before it's broadly available in the world. And you know, you'll know you iterate and iterate and iterate and try and you know build a game that works at that point before you end up going worldwide with it. So. That, that's see. sort of the life cycle of a game. And then uh, with a lot of these online games, the development doesn't stop at that point either because you'll do live uh, live operations for the game after that point, actually adding new stuff to it, uh, doing customer support and that sort of thing. So it might go on for gotcha. years after the game is done um, at that right. point. But So that's, right. kind of the, uh, then, that's kind of the life cycle of a game. <laughs> got it. And then there's like also different versions um, and then it might extend out uh, to some, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, ideally, you have a game that people love, and and, and uh, you, you want to put a lot of effort into that because people are, are playing it. And, um, so that's the that's sort of the live uh, mm-hmm. aspect of the game. A really successful game will go on for years and years after it's done. Um, so it might be something that you're always working on to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have one question from uh, Ronald, which is, "What games inspired your work?" Uh, well, geez, uh, at, at Dopio, um, so. Both my my co-founder Jefferson and, and I uh, came from Bioware, um, so we worked we worked on a lot of story-driven, character-driven games, um, and so things like Mass Effect, things like Dragon Age, I think were really big influencers for us in going to start Dopio specifically. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, those are probably two of the really big ones. I mean, we we love role-playing games and story-driven adventures, um, so that's that's sort of our uh, hey, anything like that. We've probably played it. <laughs> Oh, gosh. So th- because this is both of your interests, you've decided for your first game to uh, go, go with a role-playing game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we, um, we, we, we thought that played really nicely with voice in particular. So that's, uh, that's sort of uh, what started the studio. Cool. Um, and oh, actually, this question is interesting uh, from Rachel, which is, uh, do you ever get tired of reading your game script? Reading the game script? Uh... Well, geez, uh, I mean, it's it with a voice game and and uh, with such a branching narrative, it's actually an interesting thing. There's not really a, a game script per se. It's it's just such a diverse. Uh, you, know, uh, gra- you can imagine like a branching graph that goes in all different directions. So we actually have all these little scenes that are that are different based on all the choices that you've made. Um, so uh, and, and I mean, the, the cool thing is during development, it's changing so, so much. Like we we for the vortex, we worked with a professional writer. It's actually filming all that content, um, oh, wow. and it, it was always cool to see. You know, we we, we did the story outline at the beginning, but then it all sort of got filled in as we were, like basically day by day it was changing and evolving. Uh, so I, I know I didn't get, I didn't get tired of it uh, in, in that, that context. <laughs> oh, okay, so that's would that be like what you consider the most fun part, uh, the coming up with the story? Yeah, I I um I love that 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 uh. That, that that production phase, we're actually like, hey, we we, we have an idea, we're really passionate about, and let's actually uh, take it to fruition. That that's a that can be a grind at times. Uh, but I see. I mean, like that's that's the real gratifying part. Of, like, hey, look, we're, we've we've made this thing, and now it's we're, we're we're taking it to the point where we can actually put it in front of customers, and the, you know, people can start having fun with it. That's right. that's what I like. To do. Okay, and, or those would be um, those would be considered the soft releases for when you're testing it before you um, push it out for worldwide purchase. Yeah, yeah, the, the soft launch is like, hey, we have kind of a finished game at this point. Let's let's okay. get it out in front of like real customers, uh, mm-hmm. and then iterate on it. Like like I was saying, it, it's all about getting feedback as quickly as possible right. and, and increasing the fidelity of that feedback as we go along. The best feedback is going to come from an actual market, from people that are paying actual money. Uh, yeah. There's nothing. Nothing really speaks to whether somebody liked it or not, as much as if they paid, chose to pay for it or not. <laughs> so, right, and then if they yeah. refer their friend, uh, like recommend it to their friends, then that's right, like right, even exactly. more recognition. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, and then uh, I believe this is the last slide. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, do, do do you feel that the reaction result of your game matches the work you put in during development? Ooh. <laughs> Uh, sometimes yes, and sometimes yes. <laughs> yeah. like, like I was saying earlier, I mean, you always have to be open. You can't get too, uh, you can't, you can't treat your your development too preciously. I mean, you have to be open to the fact that hey, this might just not be a thing that a lot of people like. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, you know, yourself, and uh, right. you know, in order to be a successful business, you have to recognize, okay, this is. This is a time to cut the losses and not not spend any more time on this. Let's shelve this. Let's look at it and see what was good, and maybe see what we could take out and do another game with. 
um, you know, so sometimes yeah, it can be disappointing. Like, hey, we put a lot of effort into this, but people just didn't like it. Like, it's it definitely the thing that can happen, um, and you need to you need to sort of uh, be aware that, that that's a uh, that's part of the process <laughs> for sure. <laughs> right, right, right. Don't don't be too married to uh, what uh, the time that you've spent with developing it. Yeah, that's because all, it's it an improvement. Cost, so always yeah. move forward if you can. Right. Um, and then also, what languages uh, programs do you mainly work in? So uh, at Dopio, all of our software is uh, server-side software, actually, because the cool thing with the, with, the, with the Alexa is that it's really a web interface, so you think that that audio is making a web request to your backend. So we're all doing server, and all of our programming is Java, um, actually. So it's, it's all Java oh, programming. Oh, awesome. Java server. Um, cool. Java is my, my primary language. I've been working with it for, for a very long time, and I, I like it quite a bit. Um, yeah, and we teach in Java. So yeah, that's, yeah, it's, that's it's a super useful language, and it's, it's a super cool time to be doing Java, too, because it's, it's really developing and changing so quickly now, whereas for a, a, a lot of years there, it was pretty stagnant. <laughs> but in, the, in, the, in the last few years, uh, uh, Oracle, who kind of owns uh, owns the, the sort of IP behind Java, uh, changed their development approach, and it's really developing a lot faster now, so it's, it's kind of a cool platform to be working in. Um, <laughs> but uh, in terms of uh, other game development, um, I use a ton of scripting languages. I use a ton of JavaScript. Uh, I use a ton of Python. Uh, I, you know, um, in, in terms of actual like client software, when I go back to the mobile stuff I did, that was all uh, in the Unity game engine. Uh, and the, okay. primary, the primary programming language for that is actually C Sharp, which is really Java-like. <laughs> so if you know Java, you can you can pick up C Sharp pretty quickly because the concepts okay. are pretty similar. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I say those are those are the. Right now we're 100% Java, but in the past those are probably the big uh, big things mm-hmm. I worked with. Right, right, right. Um, and yeah, what? Um, so for for uh, if Java is your first language, how hard was it for you to pick up um, Python and JavaScript uh, and other languages? It's not hard. I mean, what what, what you'll find is that there are a number of uh, of paradigms. Uh, Java is in the object oriented paradigm. So uh, once you get over that hump of learning the, the sort of core concepts that, of, of object-oriented programming, it's really easy to pick up any other language that, that shares those sorts of concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a little bit more of a learning curve when you want to go into other types of paradigms. Um, the cool thing right now about Java is that they're bringing in some of those paradigms. So if you're, if, I don't know what you guys, what level you guys are teaching with them, but uh, you know, things like uh, Lambda functions and that in Java are part of the functional programming paradigm. And there's whole languages that are built uh, in, in, in that, that sort of a way of thinking. So there are some of those that are a little bit more difficult to learn than others, but generally all, all of these oriented languages share common concepts, so it's really easy to, you know, once you know one, to go pick up something else. Okay, right. And um, what are some benefits for you uh, to be learn, to learn Java as a first language instead of, like, let's say, Python, which is um, on the more popular side right now? Yeah, so a lot a lot of what I like about Java is uh, what a lot of people hate about Java to some degree is that it, it, it actually forces you to think um, concretely about um, I think a lot of a lot of uh, what people get lost with uh, newcomers to to, to uh, sort of object oriented programming get lost with are, are the concepts of types uh, mm-hmm. and how how they interact with each other. Um, a lot of languages like like Python in particular are a little bit looser with how you define uh, what types of variables can hold different types. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Java is very explicit uh, about you know defining what types are, what type of variable is, what the type hierarchy is. Um, mm-hmm. And that can be a pain uh, once you're down the road a little bit because you know you're it ends up being a little bit more verbose than some other languages. But when you're getting right. started, I, I find that really comforting, really, really, uh, really uh, demystifying to, to sort of make that concrete and, and right there on the on the page. Um, so mm-hmm. to me, like that was one of the nice nice things that I, I enjoyed anyway. You know, uh, picking that up as my first language. I see. I see. Instead of um, for uh, when the libraries are like pre-built for you, and it's like much more, I guess, quicker to to prototype uh, with other languages. Yeah, and, it's. I mean, it, it's definitely a lot quicker to just throw a line of Python like into a, into a script interpreter there, but uh, as opposed to creating the whole class thing for Java. But uh, I mean, they're they're bringing some of those benefits to it now too. Like in the latest uh, the latest build of the JDK, you have the the, the actual uh, J shell um, app where you can actually type. Uh, code in and, and execute in real time. Um, so that, mm-hmm. I, that's that's a tool that I love to use now, even where I can, if I get an idea, you don't need to create a whole class and the main method and everything. You can actually just run the run J shell, type it in, and see what the result is. And say, oh yeah, that'll work. And then you can just paste that line right to the oh my program gosh. that you're actually working on. So that's uh, my, my my flows have started to change recently too with all this new stuff. So 
That's fantastic. Don't really yeah. Um, okay, we're actually a little bit over time. Um, Jackson, Rachel, do you guys have any uh, follow-up questions? Um, bef uh, and also people in the audience, if there's anything else you'd like to um, ask, please uh, do so. Um, I think we probably can go for another five minutes or so, Chris, if you don't mind. Yep. No, no, no. Yep. Uh, yep. Rachel, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Oh, you're good. Okay. Cool. Um, and audience members? Um, Ronald asks, uh, what is the worst language you've programmed in? <laughs> oh, geez. It's, it's hard to say, uh, worst language. I mean, everything has pluses and minuses. I mean, I think certainly, um, as you get closer to the metal, uh, a lot of the guardrails can go off and you can end up with really frustrating bugs because the computer will always literally do what you tell it to do, but, uh, you know, what you'll find is that the computer doesn't think the same way that you do a lot of the time. So, uh, so once you get down to things like like a like a C or something like that, it's it becomes a lot uh, a lot more difficult to articulate yourself. <laughs> a lot of the, the higher level languages like like Java uh, abstract away the sort of inner working for the machine a little bit more and make it easier to work with. But uh, I mean, every, honestly, every language has its pros and cons. So I, I, it's hard to say like there's one that's the absolute worst language to work with. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, um, right. It's it's a matter. I think uh, for a lot of students, it's just um, getting in there and trying things yourself first instead of thinking like what the language is. A lot of it is you should um, get uh, start learning CS by learning the concepts instead of um, focusing on like that you'll specifically learn Python or or C plus yeah. plus. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Because like like I was saying, it's it, they're really the, the concepts are really portable, right? So if, I mean, if you learn if you learn to focus on one of these, uh, get really good at it. You'll find uh, after a certain point, it doesn't take much time at all to get to get up to speed on any any other language with similar concepts. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and also I guess um, uh, oh, one more question um, from Ping Xiong. Um, are you going to post a seminar? Right? Oh yes, yes, we will. Uh, we will post uh, the recording for the seminar um, uh, for the parents and students who were not able to uh, listen in live. So definitely. Um, also, I guess um, on a closing note, Chris, is there anything, uh, any advice you have for young programmers um, who before, uh, who are in high school or middle school or even elementary school if, for if they're interested in um, being a software engineer or just um, being a game developer? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, like, just go do it, right? That that that's that's the most valuable piece of advice. Like, nothing is stopping you right now. I mean, from just going and downloading, like, uh, Unity. Unity has a great free piece of software you can download, uh, mm -hmm. and a great set of tutorials that you can follow. So, you know, you can you can download all kinds of free content, download it, follow these tutorials to change it, modify it, and grow it. So, mm -hmm. you know, don't don't uh, don't be intimidated. Just just it's all it's all available to you. Just just go just go do it. Jump jump into it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, and and you'll find yourself uh, you know making great progress. I think after not too long. Right, right, right. Um, and if you find that a lot of these resources are hard to use, or if you want some guidance, you can always take our classes at Katie Byte. Um, then we will offer um, so the core computer science curriculum. But we also have um, uh, generative art and design classes for for students who are interested in um, graphics programming, creating like really cool art and animations. Um, yeah. So I think uh, that we can wrap up here. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your insight and sharing your wealth of experience with us. Um, also, Jackson and Rachel uh, for being great panelists and um, asking very thoughtful questions. Um, and I see that we, yep, we don't have any other questions uh, from the audience. So yeah, we can end it right here. Yep, thank you, thank you everyone so much. Uh, thank you people in the audience for, for listening. Um, and uh, we will post this recording. Uh, I'll email the recording for the webinar out and also up, uh, if Chris, I have your permission to upload it onto YouTube. Sure, go ahead. Okay, fantastic. All right, thank you guys so much. Have a good evening. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.